Hello, my name is John Hedengren, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak at the spring AICHE meeting on a framework for hybrid machine learning with an open source Python Seek system identification package. Now, some of the concerns that I've heard about system identification is that it's very mathematical, sometimes difficult to apply in practice, especially in industrial settings where you need to be able to give the software to those who can easily import data, be able to recreate models, share them in other, in other ways. My objective with this presentation is to show some of the latest advances and how those can be applied with this new tool to enable data import, data selection, model fitting, and then model export. And I'll share also some additional methods that we're developing with hybrid machine learning. So let me review the outline for this presentation. The first part, we'll talk about simulation and system identification and give some background on what's commonly done in industrial practice and then some of the latest developments. Some of the latest developments are long short-term memory and transformers to be able to regress time series or sequential data. We also have some additions on physics-informed neural networks and how physics-based information can be applied to the neural network fitting process to improve extrapolation. Next, I'll give a demonstration of the SEEK system identification add-on and then end with some conclusions and future thoughts. So as we think about process development, whether that's designing a new process or optimizing an existing process, there are many reasons that we want to use models. And that could be through quality control, troubleshooting, optimization, decision making, or safety analysis. Now for process testing, it's often very time consuming and costly to do step tests or other types of tests on a running process. So for that reason, we use simulation. It's much more cost effective. We can use historical data. It's often safer than taking a loop in manual and doing step tests or other types of tests where you're perturbing purposefully the process in order to be able to derive models. It's also often much faster than real time. You can prototype new applications very rapidly. Also, there's a tendency <clears throat> toward remote work. And we've seen this more that you know, all of these reasons are advantages for simulating the process, developing this digital twin that can be used in many ways. So as we take a look at, for example, drilling process, where you might be able to simulate what's going on down hole and derive new control algorithms or new ways of operating that just use simulated data without having to do tests on a real well where there could be uh, potential for unexpected gas influx or other types of uh, issues with very expensive and uncertain control technologies. Okay, so we want to develop this digital twin and it's really a process for building mathematical models of a dynamic system using the system input and output measured data. So this input and output measured data is going to be used to develop this uh, mathematical relationship between the two. So the different types of models that we can use. A white box consists of first principles or fundamentals this physics-based information that is often expensive to develop and hard to fit to data. Then you have on the other side a black box model. These are data-driven models, empirical, artificial neural networks. They're easy to develop, especially if you have the data, but um, they can be poor in extrapolation. So often we want to try to combine the strengths of both of those, maybe a reduced order white box model or some other type of hybrid model where we've mixed elements of the physics-based information as well as the empirical fitting procedure. There are many different types of models that are used uh, typically in the planning and scheduling all the way down to the valves and actuators. P 
PID controllers that control flows and pressures and temperatures. Now we have anywhere from linear to rigorous models and also steady state or dynamic models as well. And some of them are not even models or optimizers, they're just a deterministic control policy. And the execution interval varies from weeks to months, hours, minutes, and seconds. Now, one of the things we see here is that we often have a mix of these types of models. And so we know that we can develop, you know, in this case, maybe a steady state, a dynamic model. Can we start to mix some of these elements in order to be able to give us the improved extrapolation and performance over a longer period of time or with less data that perturbs the process when we do the data fitting? So many different types of models. We have here linear models and nonlinear models. And we have everything from state space models, transfer functions, autoregressive with exogenous inputs, finite impulse response, and others. And on the nonlinear side, we have LSTM models, long short term memory models. You have Hammerstein Wiener models. You have transformers, so these are going to be neural networks, physics informed neural networks, or just pure physics based models. So many different types of models depending on the knowledge of the process and the data availability as well. So let's just review some of the polynomial models. So we first of all have an ARX model that has an autoregressive, but also an exogenous input. So these would be your inputs that you can't necessarily dictate, but are, or maybe you can, uh, these are gonna be like your actuators or disturbances that you can measure. Okay, if you go on to FIR models, these are commonly used in DMC controllers. This finite impulse response model is just these exogenous inputs you might have 120 of these or 240 of these in series, and then you obtain these coefficients, the B parameters, that help you develop this model. Now, these are both linear models as well as RMAX models as well, where you have an autoregressive, exogenous input, but also a moving average. So additional polynomial models, you have ARMA models that have an autoregressive and moving average, or just a moving average, or just an autoregressive model. So many different types of models have traditionally been used for time series modeling. I wanna talk just a little bit about uh, some additional developments that have taken place in addition to transfer function models and state-space models. All of these are linear models and there's generally a direct translation between these different forms. So now we have a timeline of how sequence data has been used, especially in uh, large language models or in translation, where there were LSTM models developed. And then in 2015, you have the attention mechanism with the sequence of sequence models. And then in 2017, the transformers. And that has spawned a development in large language models and translation, okay, where you had GPT-1 and GPT-2, 3, and uh, now 3.5, and things like chat GPT that have really transformed some areas of this technology for using as uh, chatbots or other purposes for generative text. So the, the general, uh, generative pre-trained transformers are just one example of how transformers are being used uh, for these large language models. So as we look at the developments uh, of this in the past year, I asked to just give an example, optimization example in Python Gecko. And you can see that it understands how to solve optimization problems in Python. And then if I ask it to translate that to Pyomo instead, it has the same optimization problem with um, in Pyomo. And then as we go on, uh, go on to the next one, 
Okay, I'm going to ask it to solve it as well with Kasadi. Again, another optimization platform. And in each case, uh, ChatGPT knows these modeling languages and knows how to solve this same problem in these different modeling languages. So I can ask it uh, even different languages, like in Julia, and it's going to know how to solve this with jump in Julia, the same optimization problem. So we've cl clearly seen quite a few innovations happening with these transformers. And one of the questions we ask is, can we apply some of these same advances in process simulation and developing these time series models? So let's go ahead and review, first of all, this timeline. The very first thing that was developed were these recurrent neural networks, where you have neural networks that are equal to a series of these neural networks stacked together, where the output of one is then fed through another neural network to produce another output. And you stack these in this way in order to be able to estimate some sort of a time series. All right, and then along came the long short-term memory. These are just a little bit more advanced than things like GRUs or just standard recurrent neural networks where this uh, you have a forget gate, an input gate, and an output gate with these different functions and unknown parameters. One of the problems with this is a vanishing gradient problem where everything is sequential, but it almost tends to forget, you know, just with a, a finite horizon, what happened before, and you're missing some of the context. Also, there might be data after and before, and you might want to use that information instead of purely sequential with one step ahead prediction. But what we have to do is we have to take our data, as shown here, with this window and a prediction horizon. We're going to use that later in model predictive control and be able to put this into that framework so that we can use some of these types of models in the environment, not for large language models that have tokenizers that convert it to numbers, but to use the numbers directly to be able to predict these dynamic models. So one other advancement is this attention mechanism that we've seen with the transformers, where there's an attention distribution with probabilities that relate how each of these pieces of information relate to the final outcome. And what we have is an encoder decoder that's in the middle is this softmax or probability distribution that tells how those different elements are related. The one additional innovation that Junho Park made on this was to also preserve the sequence of numbers because that's also important for this, uh, this transformer prediction. Okay, so let's look at this transformer architecture. It's shorter processing time, no vanishing gradient problem, and it's able to capture the irregular temporal dependency within the models. So it isn't that you have to have something that happens within the last 10 steps. It could be something that happened two minutes ago or 10 minutes ago that then influences the current uh, prediction. All right, and then one other innovation that is really important here is to be able to use physics-based information in training the neural network. And one of the things that we tested here was to test over smaller magnitude data, okay, with the inputs here that are small inputs, and then be able to test it with larger inputs to be able to test the extrapolation. How well this model does is it goes from this type of data that's trained to this type of data that is then where you're testing it. And this sometimes happens where, you know, these might be your step tests. And then once you develop a controller optimizer, it's found or it thinks it's found a new operating region. And so it wants to push it outside of the current envelope and operate in a different region. And so we wanted to see if this would help, where we take the standard, okay, neural network, and we fit the prediction 
of the neural network to the measurement. Maybe that's a mean squared error uh, or a, uh, a squared error. And then we also combine that with the mean squared error from the, the physics-based model. And here we see just the general form for a physics-based equation and where you have time, your derivatives, and your state variables, and then also your exogenous inputs. So you could have a combination of these two where you train it and evaluate it with these physics-informed neural networks. So let's just look at the result of this with this temperature control lab device. Now this is just on heater one right here. And you can see the training here just on a smaller steps that are given. And you can see with the physics-based information on this lower plot, you can see that it trains it more quickly. And also we found that it, you need less data in order to be able to train it. The convergence is much faster. You can see this it's trying to reduce that error, but it just takes more training in order to be able to do that without the physics-based constraints. So one of the developments that we're working on in our research is to combine some of these elements that are available in the machine learning community, such as scikit-learn and also TensorFlow, and be able to integrate those into a dynamic optimization and modeling platform in Python. And one of the things that we've done as well with the support of Ashwin Venkat and Seek is to be able to make this more user-friendly through this interface. To be able to give those who work in an industrial setting uh, and also be able to give this tool to those that may not have the background or the patience or the time in order to be able to work out the code themselves, to be able to give a graphical interface to some of this work. Now we've used some of this already in our project with Pacific Northwest National Labs in uh, the vitrification of nuclear waste and be able to optimize the waste loading. And there's some uncertainty, okay, in this uh, glass formulation and also in the optimization results. So we want to be able to use optimization under uncertainty, but also be able to use some of these machine learned models like uh, the neural networks from TensorFlow or Gaussian processes or others that handle uncertainty natively within the application, within the model. And then also be able to solve other types of optimization problems such as forecasting, optimizing, simulating, and integrating. This is a project with Idaho National Lab on integrating small modular reactors into the grid. So I'll give a, just a demonstration of Seek. You have Seek Organizer, Seek Workbench, and Seek Data Lab. And we're going to be talking a little bit about how this integrates with Seek Workbench as a Python module that runs as a Jupyter Notebook. So the SysID add-on, uh, you need to obtain it by uh, pip install seek sysid. And it's freely available with a commercial friendly license, the MIT license, uh, or BSD, I don't remember which one. Uh, one of the two allows for commercial use. And it integrates in with seek workbench so that you can slice data out and be able to import that into the tool and be able to do the regression. And then once you're done, you can push the model and the calculations back into the workbench. So with this, we have a number of different models here. So time series, subspace identification, neural network, and also transfer function as listed here as well. I'll just talk about, you know, uh, example here. This is the Tennessee Eastman process. It's a, a realistic plant that was donated by Tennessee Eastman to be able to help study these types of compl complex processes. 
and you have many measurements, manipulated variables, recycle stream, an unstable open loop, and uh, multi-rate sampling time, and noise corrupted data. So many of the characteristics that you'd expect from an industrial process. And you can see the correlation matrix on how these variables relate to each other. The diagonal is its correlation with itself, and then you have strong positive correlations, and then strong negative correlations that are there in red. So you can run this type of correlation matrix to be able to tell what variables are related to uh, the others. And in particular, we're interested in obtaining these relationships so that we can see you know, which variables we should develop models for, especially dynamic models. Now as we look at uh, being able to select the variables, we select the manipulated variables and control variables. There's a number of different model structures that you can choose from, and then you identify the models. And this is the train stage, and then there's a validation as well that's listed here. We can load in validation data and be able to test that model on that additional data set. So this is the process. First, select the data, select the model, identify, and then push the model back into the platform. Let's talk about another one, a continuously stirred tank reactor. This is an example of a highly nonlinear process. In this case, we're using an energy balance, all right, and then also a mass balance as well with some reaction kinetics to be able to describe how the input concentration and the flow of the cooling water affect the concentrations of coming out here and coming out here with this dual CSTR. And so as we look at the data lab and how we import this, so for example, the manipulated variable would be the flow of the cooling water. And maybe we're trying to control the concentration coming out of reactor one, concentration coming out of reactor two, and then the two temperatures of the reactors as well. So when we identify the model, then we can see the training results here. And then when we validate the model, you can see the validation results on a different set of data. Now, one of the things that you can do as well is, you know, if you need more description about some of these, there are these tooltip pop-ups by hovering over the area to be able to give you more information on that. All right, and then when you push the signal and the formula, you push it back into the workbench. This is an example of a transfer function model right here. And you're gonna push it back into the workbench. Okay, so signal to workbench or formula to workbench as well. So the signal transfers this back and then the formula transfers this other one. So here are some resources. It's freely available uh, from this URL right here on GitHub, uh, as well as the source code that you can see. Then there's also the Gecko package as well that's also uh, freely available. All of these are Python packages that you can run through a Jupyter Notebook. All right, here are a couple of references as well. These are uh, some of the the um, subspace identification literature, and then also from the Gecko package as well. Appreciate your attention, and we'll be glad to answer any questions.